So what we'll cover tonight, um, in not necessarily this order because there are lots of the things are kind of intertwined, but uh, this is a rough outline. Um, so we'll look at the program in basics. So uh, things like a function, uh, a sub or a subroutine, uh, variables, um, arguments and events. Um, we'll have a, a quick look at uh, deciphering and understanding recordings. So how to make a recording, how to look back at it, uh, what the various bits and pieces mean. Uh, debugging. Um, so how do you see what the actual code is doing? And this is a fantastic way of learning. Um, when you look back at the debugging, you go line by line and see exactly what your code is doing. Uh, loops and other control structures. So uh, for i equals one to 10 loop um, and if and if stuff like that. Uh, so uh, the basics of programming there, how to record a macro and we'll write some code and we'll have a go at a, a couple of little simple scenarios and we'll see how they play out on the screen. So the first question is, what are macros? So macros in uh, Excel are called, they're written in a language called VBA, which is uh, Visual Basic for Applications. Um, it's basically, it's, used, it's code that you can use to automate repetitive tasks. Um, you can also use it to write custom functions in Excel. So for example, you could write a function uh, for converting centigrade to Fahrenheit or Fahrenheit to centigrade or basically pretty much anything that you want. And you can use it as one of the normal functions uh, in Excel as you would with max, min or any of the other built-in functions in Excel. There's very similar functionality also available in uh, Microsoft Word, Microsoft PowerPoint, and Microsoft Access. And they all use Visual Basic for applications, even though the code is very, very similar, but there's a small differences in it. But if you learn the gist of how to program in Excel, you'll be able to transfer that knowledge in the same way to Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, and Access. Before we start, Use the right tool for the job. Um, I think this is very important to this slide in itself. Excel is not a database. Um, you should not use it for storing large amounts of data. Um, we also, the, the fiasco that happened um, with the Department of Health, or exactly what they're called in the UK, when they missed a whole load of coronavirus tests because they ran out of space in Excel. So it is not suitable to use as a database. Um, Excel is not secure uh, and you should not use it for storing sensitive information. Whether you protect the sheet or whether you protect the workbook, it isn't secure. Um, again, Excel is not suitable for multi-user applications. And what I mean by multi-user applications, don't use it for jobs that require more than one user to access the information at the same time. And it's very tempting when you're using uh, certainly macros that you create something like a central uh, spreadsheet and you give um, copies of the spreadsheet to uh, people to use and they all feed into this central spreadsheet. It doesn't work properly for that and you shouldn't be tempted to use it for that purpose. So what is it useful? This is why we're here tonight. Um, Excel is very useful for small applications that carry out calculations and visualizations. Um, it's great for using for tabular calculations, drawing charts and as a calculator substitute. And from that end, um, when we uh, talk about macros, we can put in a lot of automation in the various bits and pieces that we use in our normal day-to-day -day Excel. So the first thing we need to do um, is we need to get access to the developer tab and it's not available uh, by default uh, when you when in a standard Excel installation. So the first thing you've got to do is, and if you want to uh, play along there as you go and we, you can have a go at writing some of the macros as we go as well. So go to the top left-hand corner in Excel and click on the file tab and go down as far as options. And when you do that, um, you can bring pages the Excel options. And I've highlighted here, you go to customize the ribbon. Over on the right hand side here, you'll see customize the ribbon with the main tab selected here. And that displays the main ribbons that we have displayed in Excel. And you need to take on the one called developer and click on OK. And once you do that, you'll see the developer ribbon uh, will be available in the, the bar at the top. Uh, so you can see how I got there with file options at the bottom. That brings you to this screen, customize ribbon, developer, okay. And this will display our developer ribbon for us. Um, the bits that we need from here are how to get at the, the visual basic window. Uh, so when you click on this, it opens the visual basic window. A shortcut for that is um, Alt and F11 key. There's also available here, uh, record macro. Um, and when you click on record, it'll also change the stop macro once you're recording. And this one here, macros, and this, if you click on this one, it'll give you a list of all of the macros that are available on the sheet. So to start off with some coding basics, uh, so we need to understand what's going on before we go and we look at the recordings and stuff like this. So these are real basics. If you have so first thing, a sub uh, is short for a subroutine. 
And a subroutine, basically, it carries out a job or it runs some code. Um, it does not return a value. So it does, some, it does some actions, but it doesn't return a value. A function. A function, again, it carries out a job or it runs a piece of code. But its main difference is that it returns a value. So it can return a value to where it was called in code. Um, it can be used in almost all cases instead of a subroutine, uh, but not. there are some special cases where it can't. Um, you can also use your function uh, to write a custom function. Uh, so, and it could be used like a built-in function in Excel. So for example, if we're that way inclined, we could write a function that's called calculate days to retirement. So every day you open up your Excel sheet, it could tell you how many days you have left to your retirement. Variables then are the next thing. So a variable is used to store information to reference or manipulate at another time in the code. And this is basically the bread and butter piece of coding. Um, most important, you should always give your variables sensible names. So calling a variable X uh, makes the code very difficult to follow when you come back to it the next day or even a couple of hours later, what did I mean X to be? If X is something like the bridge length, call it bridge length, don't call it X. And it means that when you come back to it, you know exactly what you're looking at. Variables can be different types. Uh, so they can be a string, which is what we understand as text. Um, it can be a long or an integer. So a long is a four byte integer. Um, a sh uh, integer itself is a two byte integer. So a two byte integer will go from minus three, two, seven, six, eight up to plus three, two, seven, six, eight. So if you're going for bigger numbers than that, you need to use a long instead of an integer. Single is a single precision number. So basically it's a number with a decimal. And if you look up an ex or, um, Google or anywhere like that, it'll tell you exactly what the ranges are for single. Double is twice the size of it. And again, you'll find the ranges uh, if you just Google them. There are also things like date and various other things like that. You should always declare your variables before use. Uh, and the reason for that is to make sure that your code is legible and that you don't make a mistake because it can be very hard to find what your mistakes are afterwards. So for example, with this one, if I've, I'm declaring a variable called bridge length and I'm going to make it an integer. So that means that my bridge length can be anywhere between minus 32768 and plus 32768. Variables can also be objects. And objects are things like a um, workbook, for example, is an object. A worksheet um, is an object. The application itself is an object. A range is an object. So if you've got a range of cells, say A1 to B5, um, that's an object which is slightly different to the variables that are up here. To see a variable's value, um, or to, sorry, to set a variable's value, it's always on the left-hand side of the equal sign. So in other words, if we want to set the bridge length to be equal to 100, we say bridge length equals 100. We never say 100 equals bridge length. It always has to appear on the left-hand side as the value that we're setting. If the variable is an object, then we use the set keyword to do that. So if we want to set this variable called WBK, um, we would go set WBK equals active workbook. And that will set this variable called WPK to be equal to the active workbook. And we can do some functions with that afterwards then. Sorry, so next one then is with and end with. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because when you record macros, it uses this a lot and you just need to understand what it means. And basically, it's a coding shortcut to save you having to write repetitive values. So if you take this little piece of code over here, um, we've got width selection, the selection I have highlighted in blue there just to make it a little easier to see. And basically, what it means is between the width and the end width statements, the word that appears after the width is implied before the dot in each one of these cases. OK, so this first piece of code means width selection dot horizontal alignment equals that, vertical alignment is this, wrap text equals that. And basically what it's saying is selection dot horizontal alignment equals this, selection dot vertical alignment equals this. And the two pieces of code here, the one in the red box and the one in the blue box are absolutely identical. The only difference being is that I didn't have to write selection in front of each one of these. And if you've got a list of maybe 10 or 12 properties, um, it's often easier to use your width statement. Uh, because you only have to write it once and it makes the code a little bit easier to read. When you record macros, it uses width an awful lot. Next thing we want to mention, strings or pieces of text must be enclosed in double quotes. And you can use the ampersand sign to add them together. Uh, so in other words, if you want to say A1 and colon and B2, we put our A1 because it's a string in double quotes. We put our colon in double quotes because it's a string. 
we put our B2 in quotes because it's a string. And if we were to use that statement, that would give us A1 colon B2, which is a way of referencing a range or part of the way of referencing a range. There are two basic ways of um, referring to our cells in Excel. One of them is range and one of them is cells, and they're slightly different. If we come up to the range one first, so range A to B, um, same as on a normal spreadsheet, it refers to the range of cells from the top left, which is the A value, to B, which is the bottom right hand cell. So if we were to say range A1 to B4, uh, A1 is the top left hand cell, B4 is the bottom right hand cell. Um, you can also use range in code and you can refer to just one cell. And again, it's like you would in a formula, range A1 equals test value. This is how we would set the value in, in, in the cell called A1 equal to this value called test value. Um, we can also use range is very handy when we want to use named range because again, it makes our code easier to read and easier to follow when we come back to it. So if I have a range, uh, a named range in my Excel sheet called test range, I can set the value there by going range, test range is equal to test value. Cells then is the other way. And the way cells refers to it is it only refers to one specific cell at a time. And you reference the cell by giving it the row number first and then the column number. And it can only refer to one cell at a time using that using cells. So cells three comma two refers to the cells with a row number of three and a column number of two. Uh, so that would be in this case cells three two is the same as cell B three. There's another little way then that we can um, if we want to make it a little bit easier to when we're writing macros if we're writing macros that cover a lot of cells and there's a lot of looping and stuff like that to do it's sometimes more easier to refer to um, the values in our cells as the numbers rather than as ranges. Because if you're going to, for example, column uh, AX, well, what number, what column number is that? And it could be hard enough for mere mortals like myself to figure out what's going on. Um, so what we can do with that is if you go again to uh, in your Excel options and you click on formulas, if you take this guy here for the R1C1 reference style, what this does is Instead of using letters for the column numbers, it uses numbers. And when we do that, our Excel sheet will look like this. So instead of having the usual E, C, D, E, F, G up along here, we now have numbers. And it becomes much easier when you're writing code to use this cells value to reference particular cells. And it's just an easier way of doing it. Um, I don't know anybody who uses this when they're using normal formulas on their sheets because the formulas are very much more difficult to follow. So horses for courses. For sometimes for writing code, it's good to use this. Most times it's not. So the next thing then is debugging. And this is where we see how our code is working, what the values are. And so it allows you to see what your code is doing while it's running. So you can actually stop it as it's going and have a look around. It's a really, really good way of learning what a, record, a recorded macro does, or um, obviously written macros as well. You can use it exactly like that. But for recorded macros and when you're starting off, it's a great tool to learn what is actually going on under the hood. So a breakpoint stops the code for examination. So if you put a, a breakpoint in your code, the code will run as far as that and it will stop and it will wait for some user input from you before it goes on again. To set a breakpoint, we can either click in the gray bar to the left, in which case you'll see the line get highlighted in red like that, which means that the code will run as far as here and then it will stop. So you can add it by clicking in the gray border. You can click on F9 or you can go to the debug menu and go toggle breakpoint. In general, it, the easiest thing to do is to just click in the gray bar on the left-hand side. Once you've stopped your code um, and it's running, the, the active line will be highlighted in yellow, but you can hover over any of the variables and it will show you a little tooltip on the screen with the value highlighted. You can also right-click for your shortcut menus. Uh, and while you're running, if you right-click, um, you'll get this shortcut menu. And in there, there are three useful guys. Uh, the first one is run to cursor. So if you place your cursor on a particular line and you click on right click and click on run to cursor, your code will run as far as your cursor and then it will stop. You can use the next one, set the next statement. So you can, you can pick a particular line, you can right click, click set the next statement and it will skip all of the, the lines of code to where it currently is and set the next statement that you've identified for, for execution. And um, the third one then is show the next statement. And if you click on this one, it will, the, the code will tell you, well, what is the next line of code that it's going to execute? So if you're within a loop or something like that, is it going to hop out or whatever? What line is it actually going to, what line is it going to execute next? 
Most important button by far is F8, and that steps through your code line by line. So when you click F8, it will execute the next line, click it again, it'll execute the next line and so on and so forth. Uh, F5 will run to the next breakpoint or to the end of the code if there isn't any breakpoint there. So these are the two bread and butter buttons that you're going to use all the time. So we'll have a go at recording a macro and see how we get on. So what we're going to do is we're going to open a blank worksheet. Uh, we're going to pick on any cell. We're going to click on a record macro, which is again, it's on our developer toolbar. Uh, you click on record macro. Uh, in the cell, the cell we've picked, we're going to write in, this is a test. We're going to change the text color to red. We're then going to pick the cell below it. We're going to type in there, this is another test. We're going to change the font weight of that particular cell to bold. And we're going to see what's happened. We're going to see how the, the macro actually gets recorded. So bear with me now for one second. So I'm going to click up here on uh, cell A1. You can play along there if you want as you're going. I'm going to go to my developer tab. I'm going to click on record macro. I'm going to call it test Monday. We can call it what we want. We can put in a description here as well, which is always very useful when you're making a proper macro rather than just a, a little quick demonstration here. Uh, so we click on OK, and it's now recording. So in cell A1, I'm going to type in this is a test. And I'm going to change the font to red. And then I'm going to click on the cell below it. I'm going to say this. Is also a test. And this one I'm going to make bold. Okay, so we finished now. So we're going to go back to our developer and click on stop recording. And we'll see where our stuff went. So if we go back into our, so just to, to get at this window here, uh, it's either Alt F11 or click on the developer tab and click on Visual Basic. We'll open up this tab for you. In here in the Explorer, you can see all of the sheets that we have. So you may come in and it may look like that. So these are all of the sheets that we have in our workbook. And under modules, when you record a macro, it get the system itself will create a new module for you. And in this particular one, I have three already. So it will have gone in and this is the one it wrote for me. Okay, so I called it Test Monday. Um, it puts in Test Monday macro. You can see that there's a single quote at the start of each line there and the text is green. This means that it's a comment. So we can put anything we like in the comment uh, and it doesn't get executed in the code. It is extremely important to put plenty of comments in your code because when you come back and you look at it, or if you give it to somebody else to try and figure out, the comments should describe what's happening in the code. Your code should never ever be very complicated. You should try and split it out and write it well, rather than trying to squeeze it all onto as few lines as possible because for maintenance purposes, it becomes an impossible task. Okay, so what is it recorded here for us? So the first line that is recorded is active cell dot formula or one C one equals this is a test. So what the system did was it said right on the active cell, the formula that's going in the cell, and it's using or one C one, which is always uses by convention in uh, VBA. It is identical to saying formula. Um, and in here we just put in some text and we said this is a text. Uh, this is a test, and we put it, it. It automatically put it in double quotes for us. It then come down and you can see our, for our width statement here. So we've got, I'll just space it out a little bit. We can see width is here and we can see end width is here. So what is it withing for us? <laughs> and the item it has decided to um, include for us is selection.font. So this line here is exactly the same as if I wrote down selection.font.color. And in here, it said it's decided to set the color to this value. It's an internal uh, constant called minus one, six, seven, seven, six, nine, six, one. We could put in CR red there, or we can just allow Excel to do it for us and pick the colors as we go. It also put in this guy, dot tint and shade. And that's where we put some tint or shade in the cell to go form cells. We didn't do that. So it automatically set it to zero. That means if there was something there, it will set it, it will remove it for us. So that's the first, what we did on the first cell. We then come along to the second cell. So range a2.select. So we went and we clicked on cell a2. It then goes along and it says active cell. So now the active cell is range a2, which would be this cell. And it says active cell dot formula or one C1. Again, we can use or one C1 or we can just use formula equals this is also a test. So this is the text that we typed in the box. 
And then it says selection.font.bold equals true. So it is setting the font to bold. So the font.bold property is equal to true in this particular cell. Okay, so if we just clear that. So we've got nothing there. And we come along here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on F8. And I'm going to use F8 all the time. So in the debug menu, you can see here, step into is F8. Uh, run is F5. So if we click on here, we can see F5. But we could also do to put our breakpoint in there. We could click on F5. It will run as far as here. Click on it again, it removes it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on F8. So starting. It's now on the first cell. So active cell dot formula equals this is a test is what's going to get put into the cell that I'm currently on, which is the, in my case is A1. There we go. So now it's selection dot font. Again, our selection is uh, A1. And it's going to make the color red and it's going to make sure there's no tint in there. And end with, we're finished with that. It's now going to select range A2. So we'll see it hop down. And in here, it's going to put the formula. This is also a test. And you can notice here if I put my mouse over um, the value here of active cell. The active cell that formula at the moment is equal to blank. There's nothing there. If I was to go back, well, I can't because my active cell has changed, but um, if I was to go and put my value down here, I can see exactly what the value is. So if I click on F8 and just run that and click back, it now says the formula is this is also a test. And we'll notice over here, it has also put the value in for us. And now it's going to make it bold. And there we go. So it has made it bold. Now, next little thing, just clear that again. Just click over here and do it. And if we run it again, we'll see what happens. So active cell, this is a test yet. Yeah, so it has done that for me. That's perfect. And range A2, oh, that's not what I wanted. Because now it has put my first line here and it has put my second line over here, which is no good. That's not exactly what I wanted to do. And the reason for that is because I didn't tell it where to start really. I only said active cell. I could have stated which one I wanted it to start on. So we'll try that now. So instead of active cell, what we're gonna do is we could use this logic and we could say range a1.select and then active cell that formula. Um, or we can just do it in one step. And instead of saying active cell, what we'll do there is we'll say range a1 dot formula equals that, okay? And then with selection dot font, we have to be careful there because our selection is gonna be whatever cell we're on. So we've also got to change it here. We'll just copy that, put that in there. And then range A2 is fine. And again, we don't wanna bother selecting the cell because we might want to stay on the cell that we're on. So we'll change this guy as well. So we'll click on range A2. And we'll say range A2 dot formula is equal to, this is also a test. And we'll change in there as well. So we haven't, we're not going to select that because we don't need to. So now we should get the same result. If I click over here, we should get the same result up here. If we do that, hopefully, fingers crossed. So range A1, yeah, good stuff. Change the color first. Now range A2 formula. And I had it bold already, sorry. Let's go make it bold. So there you can see how you can refer to um, your cell in a different way. And you don't always have to put in what, what, um, Excel has written for you, but once you understand what's going on, you can do the same, you can accomplish the same thing. And just to show you, just for pig iron, if we just change that, clear all, we can change this and we can refer to it as cells 1 1. Again, we need to change it here. And we'll change it here. Let's say, uh, so it's row comma column so it's row two column one is what we're looking at put it in there as well and we should get the same result if we do that oops that could spell and there we go OK, so that's that's the basics of how we navigate around how to look at a cell and how to look at a range. So there are the different ways that we can we can approach each of them. So now we'll go on to uh, something very slightly more complicated. Um, so the next thing we want to look at are loops. And there are essentially three main types of loops. Um, 
some of them you use uh, because they're your favorites and some of them you use because they're handier than others. And it's, again, it's horses for courses. There are 101 different ways to achieve all of these objectives. And it's whatever you're comfortable with and whatever, whatever you like using. For this particular one, this is for i equals one to 10, execute this piece of code, hit the next value and go back up. So this particular one, i will go to one, come back to here, he'll be two, run this, come back to here, three and so on. So this piece of code will run 10 times in here. So this is what it looks like for it little example. So for i equals one to 10, show a message box, the value of i is, and then an ampersand because we're adding on some text here, i. So we're going to just pick up the value of the loop at the time. And if we were to run that piece of code, we would get the first time we run it, we'd get the value of i is one, we click on okay, the value of i is two, and so on. And we'd end up clicking okay 10 times to make it run. Slightly different approach to that is while and w end. And this one works by saying while the particular condition is true, run this piece of code, hit W end and go back and keep on going until this condition is no longer true. So an example of that one is we set our value I equal to one. So while I is less than or equal to 10, again, same message box, the value of I is and I, and then we've got to remember here, we have to increment our counter ourselves. Uh, so in this case, we have to say i is equal to i plus one. So the first time we come through here, i will be one. So we'll get to this line and we'll say i is equal to one plus one. So i will get set to two and it'll hop back up here. And again, that little loop will run 10 times and you get to click your OK button 10 times. The third common one then um, is for each x in y, run this piece of code and go to next. And this one is used for objects. Um, so here uh, we can see that we're going to define our dim cell range as range so we're telling the compiler that this variable called cell range we want it to be a range we're then going to set cell range equal to range a1 to b4 okay so the top left cell is a1 the bottom right hand corner is b4 so there happen to be i should have made a mistake here there should have been 10 cells in it but there are eight in this we then set loop range we another uh, variable. So we set loop range as range, and we're going to use that one to loop through all the values in this one. So essentially, our loop range corresponds to our x value, and our cell range dot cells corresponds to our y value here. So we're going to say for each x in y is for each loop range. So for each single range in all of these cells, we're going to pop out our message box once again. So this time it's a slightly different message. We're saying the cell row is and loop range dot row. So if you remember back, we could see the, the, the row value and the column value in the sheet. So loop range dot row is a property of the loop range uh, variable. And we're saying loop range dot row, and we're putting on a semicolon, and then a column, a colon, and a space, and then the loop range dot column value. So we can see here that it says the cell row is space three. So that's the cell row is space, and this value is three in this particular loop that it went through. And then a semicolon, so our semicolon is there, and a space, column, colon, space. So semicolon, space, column, colon, space. And then our loop range dot column is our number one in this particular way through. And again, that would execute eight times because there happen to be eight cells in that particular range. There are plenty of other ways of uh, looping around uh, in your code as well. Uh, there's do while, there's do until, and there's various other bits and pieces. Again. You pick one or two uh, that you like. I like using while and while end because it, it suits a lot of the type of stuff that I do. For i equals a low value to a high value is often very useful. And this one we have to use for objects. It's different to these types. So another little example, we can start some rows. And what we're going to do, just to explain, um, we've got these uh, rows of data here. And what we want to do is we want to insert a value or sorry, insert a row under each one. So we want to space each one out like that, okay? So you can see that my one starts at uh, row six here and we've just got a value there so we can see what's happened at the end as well. So basically I've just got 10 guys there. It starts at row six. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to set our I or our counter, our loop counter to the first row number, okay? So this is where we do it. We say I row equals six. In my particular spreadsheet, I row, I want it to be six. So I want to start at row six. 
So then this is our condition to see uh, in our while loop, and it is a cell in column one blank. Remember, if we look back at our sheet, I'm dealing in column one. I started at row six and I'm in column one. So is the cell in column one blank? So this corresponds to while cells I row, it'll be six the first time we go through column one. So remember it's row, column, or comma, column is not equal to blank. So our not equal to sign is a, a less than and a greater than sign together. So pointing to each other like that is not equal to. Um, so while our cell that we're looking at is not equal to blank, pop to the next row. So move to the next row. I row is equal to I row plus one. So if it's six the first time, we're going to make it seven. We're then going to say rows, I row and colon and I row. So this will say seven colon seven dot insert. And the function or the, the, the type of insert we want to do is we want to move all the rows underneath it downwards. We're then going to say, right, we're on row seven. And if you think about that, we're going to be on a blank row now. Uh, because we've just inserted a blank row. So we've got to go to the next row, I row equals I row plus one. So we'll go from eight. So when we come back up here, row eight will not be blank. So it'll execute the code again. So we can see every time we move, we're moving to the next row there. We're going back up as far as here. So we're running our condition again. we we'll do our jobs, come back up here. Once this doesn't become true, we hit W end. And once we do that, we hit the end here. Okay, so let's have a go at that. So here's my sheet. And here is my code. So insert rows is what I have called it here. Uh, so the first thing I did was I told the compiler that I row is an integer. I've set it to six, which is here. And we'll see what happens. So we'll come through here. So we'll see while cells I row comma one is not equal to blank, we'd expect that to say line one. And it does. We can also get at it down here. And this is called the immediate window. I just clear everything out of that for a second. Uh, if you can't see your immediate window, go to view and immediate window here, and you'll get to see the immediate window down here. Very, very useful because you can put in there, if I copy that, pop it in down here, I can see the value uh, of my variable here. So it's the value of the variable, or the value of the cell in this case is line one. What I can also do is instead of using, I won't do it here now, but uh, just show you what we could do. We could set the value that's in there. I could set it to one, two, three, and click on enter, and it will change the value for us. I'm not going to do it here now because it'll mess up our loop. Um, so our condition is true. So we've gone in here. So we're going to go from six to seven. So I row is now seven. Uh, and we're going to go rows, I row, and colon, and I row dot insert. So we're, this is where we're going to shift our row down. And if we, if I just show you this a little bit, and put it down here. You can see that's basically what this adds up to. So I row is seven, and then we're putting in a colon, and I row is seven again. So seven colon seven. So that's all we're doing here for our rows, seven, seven dot insert. And we're using the, the operation of Excel down. So once we do that, we should see our row pop down. We then have to go and we've added one on. So we're now going to be on row eight. So we're going to be on this row. So again, we should be looking at line two this time. And we are to happy days. And so on and so forth down through a loop. And you can see the values getting added in. Now we'll see when we get to the bottom. That's for row nine. And now we're on row 10, I24. And we might not want to put a value in there because for whatever reason. I mean, this is this is specific to the data that you're using yourself. But when we do this, we'll see that we add in another line at the bottom there. That might not be what we want to do. So we might want to set it up in a different way. So if we were to do it a different way, uh, we can put it back to where it was, 9, 10, get rid of that. So this is our, as we were before we started. Uh, just a simple word of warning on this. When you run a macro, that it does no one do, um, it won't do it for you. So just beware. So this time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go on to the next row each time, and I'm going to check what the value underneath it is. And I'm going to index my I row by two. So you'll see there's more than one way to skin a cat when we do this. So I'm starting at seven. And I'm saying, while it's not equal to blank, that's OK. And I'm going to go again, seven, seven, insert. But this time, 
I'm automatically hopping by two onto nine. And if I do that, you'll see, that again, it does exactly the same thing, except when it gets to the end, it doesn't add in an extra line at the bottom. And that's where you've got to use your brain yourself to see what is the actual outcome that I want from what I'm trying to achieve here. And it's important that you test it out. Always save your spreadsheet before you do, because when you use a macro, there is no undo function. Uh, so just be careful, but you've got to be, you, you've got to be mindful of what's actually happened. The debug function is brilliant and it'll see, it'll solve little issues like this for you. You know, why am I adding in a row when I shouldn't be? I wanted to stop at the end and so on and so forth. So it's always important to look at stuff like that. Um, the next one then, um, this time instead of just blindly adding in our rows, what we're gonna do is delete rows, but we're gonna delete the row based on the value in the cell. So we're gonna pick up the value from the cell and see whether we should delete it or not. So this time uh, we're gonna set i equal to our first row number. So we've set it here, i row is equal to four. That's where my sheet is starting, let's show you. So I'm starting here this time. And basically all I have, I've got a set of numbers here and I've, all I've done is I've worked out the difference between the two. And if the value is less than two, I'm just gonna delete the row. All we've done here for uh, display purposes is uh, highlighted them as yellow so that we can see if they should be deleted or not, okay? We're gonna get a, an interesting little anomaly here at the end, but we'll see what happens. We'll explain it as we get to it. Okay, so here's our, the start of our loop. Is the cell in column one blank? So while cells I row comma one is not equal to blank. So this is our condition. If it's true, we execute the piece inside. And you'll notice also that I've indented my, everywhere I have a loop, I've indented my code. So my while and my W end, everything inside that is a loop. So it's indented by one. If and end if, everything that happens between those is gonna get executed if this line is true. So I've indented my code there as well. It is extremely important to indent your code like that. Pick however many tab characters you want, two, four, six, it doesn't really matter, but it makes your code an awful lot more easy to read when you come back at it, or if you give it to somebody else. Again, I don't have any comments in here because uh, I have my rather uh, overkill uh, flow diagram here for it, but there should be comments in every line as well. And again, it's for peace of mind for yourself when you look back at something afterwards or if you give it to somebody else. So while my condition is true, so it's not blank, therefore it's true, I come down here and then I say if the difference in the next row is less than two, so that's where I'm checking here. So if the cells I row plus one, so that's the row underneath where I'm looking, first column, minus cells I row comma one, if it's less than two, then execute what's in my if, okay? And on the sheet, what I did was I put in apps around that. So I, I took the absolute value of it so that if it was minus one, it would also execute. Uh, so when we've done that, if it's if the condition is true, so if my if statement is true, it will run this piece, which is delete the row, this line here. Then move to the next row, which is here, I row because I row plus one again, because we're using a file and that's my counter myself. And back up here then, and it will keep on running here while this condition is true. Let's have a look at that. Okay. So F8 again starts me off. Uh, I row equals four. So I've started off on my first row there. I can see the value is 22. Yeah, that's what I expect. So now I'm checking is the absolute value of my I row plus one. So that's row, that's going to be five. So it's four plus one is five. So cells I row plus one was 23. So 23 is actually the value of the cell. So that's good. Minus I row this time. So I haven't added on my plus one here. You can see. So this one is the row above it. So it's 22. And that's what I'd expect to see there. So if the difference is less, if the absolute value is less than less than two, then delete the row. And again, I row, if I just look at what this says, copy it down here five to five. So it's the, the row underneath the one I'm looking at is the one that I'm deleting at the moment. Okay, so I started off on four, but it's actually gonna delete the row underneath it. So I'm on this row and I'm gonna delete this row. Okay, so when we run that, we should get rid of our 23 and it's gone there. Okay, so happy days. So now we've gone from four, we're now on five and five is 27. So we should get 29 minus 27. So the difference is not less than two. So we shouldn't go in there and we don't, which is good. 
and we'll continue on. Oops, we missed one there. We deleted a row, so we should get down to our I row is, so we're on nine now, so we are now um, here, so we should be 37, and we are, so we shouldn't, oh. Yeah, so the difference between 37 and 38 is one, so it should, again, it should delete this row for us. And it's gone. We're now on row uh, 10. It's telling us it's 41, so we're now here. And again, we shouldn't get a delete until we get to... So we're 55, and we're going to compare that to 56. So we should be getting a delete here. So this one is 56, this one is 55, so it should delete our row. Now, here is our little anomaly. Um, 57 is no longer in a difference of two here. So it's not going to, even though I had highlighted here as, oh, the difference was one. My code here is going to detect that it's not different. So it's not going to delete the, it's not going to delete the row. Okay, so we're saying 62. No, to 57. I've missed, I've missed a line there. But what we get is, you have to, the, the point I was trying to make there is you have to be careful when you're deleting code or when you're looping through it, sometimes the conditions change as you do that and you have to take account of it in your code. And you need to be very, very careful in what you're doing. And again, test it out in small little loops, make sure that everything works. Okay, how are we doing on time? 12.51. So that's how we delete rows and stuff. Um, what we'll do actually just before we go to that is we'll go back to um, here. There's a couple of other little useful files in here um, that again, we can, when you get a sheet, what they do. This one here is called unmerge cells. Uh, I've put in very scant comments there, I'll say what they're in. Um, but basically what we can do is we can, uh, it's saying with selection. So this means selection to horizontal alignment, selection to vertical alignment and so on and so forth. The most important line here is this one which says dot merge cells equals false. So if the cells are merged, it will unmerge them for us. And this is the long way. If you recorded it in um, using the, the, the record macro function, this is something like what you would get. This easy way of doing it is to just say selection dot unmerge. So if you highlight, I don't have any cells here highlight or merged at the moment, but if you were to highlight some cells and merge them and you click on that, you highlight them as a selection, you click on selection dot unmerge, it will unmerge the cells for you. These two little guys here then are unhide all and hide all. So these are possibly useful ones for um, when you've got spreadsheets that you've got lots of columns and rows on and sometimes you want to hide some of them to do some work when you want to do some work or just display it and sometimes you need to show them. So basically all I've done here is I've set up a simple little thing. Um, the columns that are the columns and rows that are highlighted in blue, I want to hide them when I um, when I run my macro and when I run the other one, the unhide all, it's going to unhide all the rows and all the columns. So just to have a little look at what they're doing. Um, this selection here cells with no distinction on it highlights the whole of the sheet. And it's the very same as clicking up here in the corner. It highlights every cell you have on a particular worksheet. So what it's saying here is cells dot entire column dot hidden equals false. So for every cell, take the entire column and the hidden property is now going to be false. Same thing with the rows cells dot entire row dot hidden equals false. The opposite guy is hide all. So I have set um, column D, column F. So I've just said column D and column F hide these two columns. And all I've said is columns D colon D dot entire column dot hidden equals true. So I'm setting the hidden property to true here. Same thing with F, set the hidden property to true. Same thing with the rows. I'm going to hide row three row seven and row nine. Again, row three, row seven, row nine, entire row dot hidden equals true. And you can just see the entire column and entire row are values that you can get at. And these are called properties when they come um, like that. So how did I get these two buttons here? If I go back to my developer tab here. I could click on insert. And in here, we've got form controls. And there are various controls in here. You've got drop down boxes, you've got check boxes, you've got numeric up downs. Um, and various other bits that you've got option groups and various other bits and pieces. But the one that gets used most often is just the button. And if you click on the button, draw it on the sheet. Um, it, oh, so I want, sorry. If I use the other one, it gives us, if I use this guy, when I do it, it asks me to assign a macro to it. 
And the one that I would want to assign to that is my, let's say, hide all or unhide all. And I've already done it on these guys here. But basically, all you would do is you click on hide all and it will run that macro when you click the button. Uh, so just delete in there out of the way because I have these nice ones. So if I click on hide, everything that I've asked it to hide is hidden. And if I click on show, everything that I've asked it to show gets shown. Simple as that. Next little guy here is uh, color misspelled cells. Does let's make it a bit bigger there for a second. What this guy does is it checks the spelling of the selected cells and colors them green and makes the text uppercase if it finds a spelling mistake. Um, so how does it do that? Um, so I set a range uh, called uh, range. So that's the, the range that I'm going to check through. X cell is going to be the individual cell within the range that I'm going to check. So I'm setting here uh, my X range is equal to the selection. So it's the active selection that's there. Um, and then just checking to see if there's nothing in it, just exit the sub, so don't do anything. Here's my loop, and it's my loop for uh, objects. So it's for each X in Y, essentially. So I'm saying for each X cell in my range, check the spelling. And I'm saying, if not, application.check spelling. So this is an inbuilt function of the application object. It's called check spelling. I just put in the value that I want to check. If I've got a not here, so if the spelling is not correct, it'll execute this. And it's going to change the interior color index to 10, which happens to be green. And it's going to make the contents of the cell into uppercase. And these two guys here, application.screen updating equals false and true. This means that you can turn off and on what happens on the screen. For the purposes of the demonstration, I'll leave them on. Um, generally, when you've got macros and stuff like this, rather than seeing the screen flicker all the time, you just turn them off. And um, it becomes easier to, to run your macros. So if we were to run that guy, if we go to spelling, so I'm just going to highlight these three. This, so the first two are fine, and the third one has a misspelling in it. So we'll run that and step through it. So my first cell is called this is a test. So that should be fine. So there's no spelling mistake there. It's happy days. Now it goes on to the next one. So it's now called this is also a test. So that's the second one. Again, spelling is okay. Now my third one, I know I have a spelling mistake there. So what it's checking is this one. So, and this is misspelled. So there's two misspellings in there. So it's now gonna change the color index to green and it's gonna make it, it's gonna make the text in the cell uppercase. So it makes it easy for you to see that you've got a mistake there. Okay, let it run to the end. And there we go. There's a couple of other ones there as well. Um, I'll probably just, just give you a quick uh, explanation of what they do. Uh, this particular one here, get all comments. So if you've got comments in a sheet, so you can see your comments like um, these guys, so they're cell comments. Uh, so if you've got these on various sheets throughout a, throughout a workbook, um, you can make a collated sheet, call, call it collated comments or whatever you want to call it. Um, and it will collate all of the comments onto one sheet for you. It'll put in a hyperlink to them. So it'll bring you to the, I've deleted some of these now, so they won't work, but um, it puts in a hyperlink to the cell. So you can click on the cell and it'll bring you to the, the, the cell on the particular sheet. It tells you who the author of the comment was and it tells you what the actual comment was. So it's actually a, a useful one that uh, you may find handy for sheets that have lots of comments on them. Again, all it does is it picks up the worksheet. It goes through each worksheet in the active, work, active workbook worksheet. So that's the collection of all of the worksheets in the workbook. It then loops through each comment in that particular worksheet. And this is how it adds in the hyperlink. So the hyperlink one is a little bit complicated, but basically the second and the third one. So we're, we're going the second column and the third column. It's putting in the author and it's picking up scomment.author, which is a property of this comment that we picked up from our comments collection here. And it's putting in the actual comment in the third column, which is scomment.txt, which again is a property available of the comment. And it loops through every comment and then it goes on the outside and it loops through every worksheet. And so I have told it to put it on this sheet called collated comments. So that's just a handy one uh, for getting up all your comments together. This one here then, this sheet split. Uh, so what this one does is if we got uh, five worksheets um, in a book, it'll save each of them as an individual workbook and it'll call the sheet the name of the workbook. So just show you what happens. So I don't have them there, it's okay. So if I do that, if I just quickly run it, it should hopefully. Again, I've got my screen updating on there so you can see the screen flicker on it. 
Okay, and it tells me at the end, copy finished workbooks created at C Eng Ireland. That's where I told it to put them. So if we look back here, see it is created. Uh, so if we look at one that we were looking at, say show hide. Uh, so this was my, um, see it there on the screen. So this is the one, and it's only got the one tab or the one worksheet uh, in here. So that's how that, I don't say it. Uh, so that's how that particular guy works. Um, so there are a couple of little useful uh, extra macros that are in there. Uh, so we're nine o'clock, so we'll just crack on here now again. So the last thing then we'll do um, is a little simple permit system. This could be anything, but it's basically how to pick information up from one place and to put it on a summary sheet. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to enter the values on a permit sheet. Uh, we're going to collate the values onto a summary sheet. We're going to assign a permit number based on the uh, current year and area selected. And we're going to display the permit number on the permit. So this is what we're doing. Um, so we're going to enter the values on our permit worksheet. So we'll just click back just so we can really see what we're doing. So this is this is my permit sheet that I've made. So I've got a space for a permit number up here. I've got a requester, area owner, so on and so forth, various bits of information there. What I've done to make life handy for myself is I've given each of the cells a name. So I've named the range for it. So I've called it requester, I've called it area owner, start date, end date, description, and so on and so forth. That makes life easy when you're working with macros. Um, it makes it very easy for you to understand it. But more importantly, when you give it to somebody else, it makes it very easy for them to understand as well, because they might, if you're like me, might think, and think it isn't always as straight as other people's might be. So this is what we're trying to do. So we're going to enter our values on our permit worksheet. We're going to click on that save button, which is going to run our macro. Um, it's going to insert a new row at the top of our summary sheet. So what we're going to do is we're going to put it in here and it's going to enter a new row in here, and we're going to pop our permit details in there, calculate the number, and come back. So, do that. so insert the new row at the top of our summary sheet. We're then going to enter the appropriate values in each of the columns that we picked up from our permit sheet. We're then going to branch off, and we're going to use a different function. We're going to, we're going to make a function that's going to return a value to us, and we're going to call that uh, function calculate the permit number. So rather than putting all the code together, calculate the permit number, we're just going to drop out and leave it as the function itself that function is going to do these jobs. So it's going to get the year from the current date. It's going to get the last two digits of the year then. So for the, at the moment, the current date is to our, the current year is 2021. So it's going to pick up the last two digits, which are 21. Um, it's going to get the area because we're going to tell it what it is. It's going to get the next number. So we've got to, if we go back to our sheet here, uh, we've got our next number in there. It's going to pick it up from there. Um, and then it's going to put our perm the permit number together and the permit number format is going to be YY, which is the last two digits of our um, of our year, the area that we picked for our permit. So in this case, the area or whatever it is, and the next number. So in this case, it's going to be zero, zero, or it's going to be four. I didn't bother putting in the zero, zero, four. If we had more time, we could do that. Okay. So it's then going to add one to the next number value. So it's going to make that when we've done, it's going to say five. So the next person that runs it is going to be okay. Uh, and it's going to return the permit number back to where we called it in the code. We're going to enter the appropriate value in each of the columns. And we're going to actually forgot a little bit there. We're going to put the permit number on top of the permit sheet as well. So let's see how we do that. Uh, sorry. So this is our save permit. Uh, so what we would do in general is we would turn our screen updating to false so we don't get that flicker. Um, what we do then is we set up um, a string value for most of the values that we're picking up, except for the date, which are going to be dates. So our permit number, our requester, our area owner, our area, start date, end date, work type, and description. All of them are strings apart from our start date and end date. You can call your variables whatever you like. The easier they are to understand, the easier it is to maintain your code and to understand what happens if you look back at it over, say, a month or whatever like that. So the first thing we're doing here is we're set S requester. So we want the, the requester value to be uh, the value that's currently in the range called requester. So our named range is called requester. And if you remember back to the first or second slide we had there, we can revert to the, the, the range as like A1 or whatever. Or if we have a named range, we can type in the named range for it. And you can see from that, that's an awful lot easier to understand than if I had put in something like A4, because we don't know what a range A4 is. But by calling it requester, we know exactly what it is. We follow the same logic then for our area owner. 
um, our area uh, start date, end date, work description and our work type and description. Next thing we're going to do then is we're going to move sheet and this is how we move sheets so, or we're not actually going to move sheet but we're, this is how we refer to cells on another sheet. So I'm specifying sheets summary. So sheets summary, we can actually see it here. We've got one of our sheets called summary and you can refer to your sheets as sheet one, sheet two, or you can use the, the name as well. I always find it's much easier to, to use the, the, the name of the sheet again because it's easier to look at the code afterwards. And again, what we're doing here with our code, this is the same as saying sheets summary dot rows three, three dot insert. And we want to move it downward on that. And three, three is the first data row on our stuff because we have to allow for our um, titles and we have to allow for where we put next number. OK, so we're inserting our, um, our empty row. We're then saying cells three, two, so we're going to put our requester in the second column, which is here, and so on and so forth over along the columns. So our area owner is the third, start date four, end date five, area six, work type is seven, and description is eight. So the bit that we haven't put in is the permit number yet. So what we said, rather than putting all our code for our calculate permit number in here, which would make it a little bit harder to understand. What we're going to do is we're going to make an extra function. We're going to call it calculate permit number. We're going to give it an art. So this is called an argument here. So we can see this is our function here and uh, called calculate permit number. And that expects to get a value call, that it's going to call area and its type is a string. So it's expecting a string value to be passed in. The value it's going to return is also going to be a string. So when I come back up here, my S permit number is going to be assigned the value that's returned from this function called calculate permit number. Okay, you can see that I've passed S area, which was the value I picked up. S area, the, the value I picked up from the range, named range called area. So I'm going to pass whatever value was in there into this function here. Um, it's going to get the current year as the function called year from date, which is our current date. Um, it's then going to, I'm making up a variable called S permit number so that I can add bits onto it as I go along. The first value I'm going to assign to it is write two characters of the current year. So this is going to say 2021 and I'm going to pick up the two characters from it. I'm then going to say S permit number is equal to whatever I assigned to it up here already and a dash and the area and the area is what was passed down in this variable here. OK, the next thing I've got to do is I've got to give a value or I'm going to call a variable called next number. OK, and next number I'm going to pick up and I could have given this a named range as well. I probably should have, but I'm going to refer to it by its full address here and it's called sheets summary and it's the range called C1. And if we just make sure that that's correct and that is actually C1 and the summary sheet. Uh, so I'm picking up my next number value. And I'm going to use it in my permit, my, my S permit number in a minute. But what I'm also, what I also have to do here is I've got to index my number by one. And it doesn't matter whether I do it before or after I pick my permit number because I'm not going to change the value of next number because I've picked it up already. So in here, I'm saying the value that goes into C1 is equal to next number plus one. So that's going to be indexed by one. And then I'm going to finish my permit number and I'm going to say S permit number is whatever the value was. And I'm going to add on a dash and my next number. And then the last step is to return the value for the function. And that's basically done by you give, you take the name of your function and you say calculate permit number is equal to S permit number. So this is the value that I want to return. We've also got another guy here down called clear permit, which we can use, we'll come to that in a second. So what I'm gonna do is just run that so you can just see what's happened. So uh, we'll clear the values. So basically with my clear, all I did was I picked up all my named ranges and I said, I want to set them to blank. And I assigned that button or that value clear permit to my button. So I'm now going to say uh, test request area owner is me. Start date is 25th Jan 21, 25th Jan 2021. My area is going to be. Area work type is going to be work 
Now my description is this is ten to display. Okay. You know, I haven't put in my permit number because I wanted to calculate it for me. So what I'm going to do now is I've got my breakpoint in there so we can see what's happening. I'm going to click on my button and it's going to step through, just step through these and we'll see what all of the values are. So we can see S requester is now test request, which is correct. Area owner was me. Area was test area. Start date 25th of the 1st. End date 25th of the 1st. Work type hot work. Description is some text display. Okay, so now we've got to go and we've got to just see what's happening as we go. Oops. So we can see we've put in our row and it's going to pop in all the values as we go down along. So it's picking up the value that I assigned to my variable up here. It's popping it into the correct place. And now I've got to calculate my permit number. So I'm going to click on F8 again, which is going to step into my next uh, one here, and we can see that we've assigned test area is the value that I put in up here. So that's what it's picked up here. So my current year uh, date is today. My current year is the year value of that, so it's 2021. My S permit number now is 21, so it took, starting at the right, it took two characters, so it gave me 21. I'm then going to tag on my area. So now my S permit number is 21 dash test area, which was my area up here. And I've got to get my next number. And my next number should be four. And yep, yeah, he's four. And now I'm going to change it to five because I've picked up my value already. So we can see that we've changed him to five there. And my permit number at the moment is 21 dash test area, which is this guy. And I'm going to add on a dash and next number. So we can see now he's called 21 dash test area dash four. And I'm assigning that value to my calculate permit number. So when I get back here, dot cells three one. Oops, I should have. Given that, because is that guy. Uh, and now sheets permit dot range permit number is going to be equal to my value and it pops it in there for us. Turn back on our screen updating, I didn't turn it off. And there we go. So that's how you put together something where you can collate values on one sheet, you can index your number on it. And again, with that, then you can go and file and print or whatever you need to do. Uh, to get your stuff out. Um, so just a last few things then. Um, in summary, most important, Google is your friend. And you will find an enormous amount of information on Excel VBA out there. When you start your, your search in Google, start off by typing in Excel VBA. So for example, if you wanted to know how to uh, set protection on a cell, type in Excel VBA cell protection. By putting Excel VBA first there, you'll come up with all of the answers like that rather than going through the front end to do it. A um, couple of easy shortcuts. Alt F11 will get you to the VBA window. Um, in debugging, F8 steps through each line. F9 puts in your breakpoint, or you can also click on the little gray bar. Um, Add watch was one that we didn't look at, but you'll see it on your shortcut value there. And add watch, you can click on a variable, right click and go add watch and it will show the value in a little window on its own uh, on the screen. And um, the immediate window was the guy that we saw at the bottom of the screen. And if you type in there question mark space and your variable name or whatever you want to go, it'll give you the current value of the variable name. And you can also use it to set the value of a variable name. So sometimes in, in debugging, if you get something wrong, you can fix it in the debug to see does your code work when you do that. And it's, it's a very useful thing to be able to do. Um, so that's that one. So you can actually set the value that you want uh, when you're going through the code. This one, can't stress it enough, always, always, always use comments. Uh, and you add them by placing your single quote and then typing whatever you want at the start of the line. The, the comment will appear as green in most people's uh, VBA windows. Um, and it's an extremely useful way of describing what you're actually doing in the code. If you don't put comments in, it can be very, very difficult to figure out what somebody else has done. Always indent your code is another really, really important thing to do. It's actually probably more important than even than putting comments in. And what I mean by that is if we have a loop like this, so we've got a for and a next loop, and we've got an if and an end if. And you can see that the for and the next, I've indented my code uh, by one tab. And for the if block, I've also indented my code. So you can see 
what information or what code is running in that particular loop and you can see what information is contained within this particular if statement so what code is going to run if this is true um, you can nest ifs you can nest loops in all sorts of ways don't get too complicated with it because it becomes very very difficult to follow the code making code very short might make you think that you're super smart but it's just a nightmare for trying to look after it afterwards or if you give it to somebody else and they have to try and figure out it's just it's not a good thing to do so keep your code simple either stretch it out or use subroutines or functions so you could see there with the last one that i did i used a function to calculate my um permit number so it just makes it easier for me to see what's going on because instead of having those 10 or 12 lines of code that i had for my calculate my permit number I just put it in a separate function and it means it's all kept together and I can see one clean line where I was calling it as just called calculate permit number. Last thing then is how do we figure out what all because it can be pretty daunting at the start. There's a thing called the object explorer and if you click on F2 when you're in the um, when you're in the VBA window or if you go view an object browser, you get a full list of every object that's in Excel. I just clicked on one of them there. I just clicked on workbooks and I can see for workbooks, it has these properties. So you can see the difference. That's a property page. And so it's got application, count, creator, item, parent. And these ones then are methods. So they're a little action item. So these actually do something. So if we wanted to add a new workbook, we'd go workbooks.add and it will give you values that you can put in there. So you can add in a new workbook and give it a name or whatever. Um, there's other things like you can close it, you can open it and various other things. So these guys, some of them are read only, uh, so you can only pick up the value from them. Uh, for example, workbooks.count, you can't set the value for that, but you can pick up the value. Other items or other values you can actually set, you can set what the properties can be. Um, so that's basically me. Um, I don't know, uh, Rowan, are you still there? Yes, Declan. Okay. Um, I don't know if, I don't know if there's anybody still following us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, Declan. Look, uh, uh, thanks very much for 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 that. Um, I suppose. Look, at we'll uh, we'll. We, there's no questions at the moment up on the Q and A. So I'll just, if if anybody does have any questions for Declan, uh, you might throw them up there. One little question I'll just throw at you, if you don't mind, Declan. Yeah. Um, and it, it's not really a DXDY, um, I suppose macro writing question, but you know, we do, we see Excel. You know, uh, people who use Excel embedding macros into them. Um, and, and do they get caught up in Excel or sorry, in email systems? Uh, like, is there any, some people are, are afraid nearly to open up an Excel file and enable a macro. They're just afraid of, you know, fear of viruses, Trojan horse and everything else. And when they see something that's not enabled, they have a fear of enabling it. And I mean, do some uh, email systems as well, do they, do they block um, macro enabled Excel files or is there any kind of, if, do you find any issues with that? Um, Yes, they can. Um, in general, I wouldn't send um, Excel enabled macros to anybody because in general, either the email system will block them, as you said, or people won't, won't open them. I know we all we all <laughs> we all know a few Nigerian princes that are going to send us Excel sheets with the macros in them. So you, need, you just need to be very, very careful because the, the macros can be extremely dangerous. And, yeah. you know, it's it, it's about being sensible and it's the same as uh, emails that you get with um, external uh, web links and things in them. I mean, you, you know yourself uh, in general, you know, well, why am I getting this? Why am I getting this email and why are they asking me to click here? And it's just, I mean, especially in the last year, I mean, things have gone mad um, over lockdown and stuff like that, that um, the amount of email traffic and stuff has gone mad. And it's just be sensible in yeah. general uh, for uh, Excel with uh, macros enabled. I would be very wary of opening a sheet that doesn't come from my own organization. Yeah. And that would be the general rule that I would use on it. If it comes from your own organization, great. If it doesn't, be yeah. very, very wary. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, just a number of votes of thanks coming in, uh, uh, Declan. And um, Don Loquive there has a question just on the permit form. Yeah. Uh, did you just merge cells to get a single input box or would you advise against using forms in Excel? What would um, you advise? Yeah, if I just um, if go back to there for one second, we should be able to see it. Can you see my screen again there, yeah? Yep. Yeah, uh, so for um, for designing forms, um, you know, they can be for forms for collecting data. Again, you know, they're not the most fantastic way of collecting data, but for, for 
quick and nasty or you know small little things that you're only using yourself they can be very handy for collecting some data for a permit system it's only in there as an example i really wouldn't recommend <laughs> using it as a permit system um but when you do design forms and um, if you look at the way i have my my form design there um i have put my columns very very close together um, and the reason for doing that is because it makes the form a lot easier. We, we touched on it in one of the, the, the previous um, demos that we did. It's an awful lot easier to design your form like that. And all I did, as you said, um, Donald, all I did for that was I just merged the cells. Uh, so I merged it across to however far I want. Um, it's an awful lot easier way to do it that way than to try and adjust if I wanted to say make my stuff wider there by taking something and making a, making a column wider. It messes up. You can see here now that my, my print area has gone off. Whereas if I just use merge, if I wanted to make this a little bit wider, all I would do is a click like that. And if I could see where merge is uh, and click merge like that. So it, it's an awful lot easier way to design your form because it keeps everything nice and tidy and it doesn't mess up your uh, your margins or stuff like that. Okay, uh, just one follow-up question there, Declan, uh, just in terms of protecting and locking uh, worksheets with passwords. I know it's not specifically a macro, uh, but yeah. you, you can... Um, Lock them. Yes, you can. You can. You can do um, two things. You can. You can lock your um, your sheet for opening. Um, off the top of my head, you do it as file and save as, and there's a choice there for your for your Excel sheet itself. You can also lock your macro window. And again, um, I haven't done it for a while now, but it will be there under. Uh, can't see it off the top of my head there, but there there's certainly if you Google it, there's a way of protecting your macro as well, so that nobody can open your macro sheet. Word of warning on that, if um, if anybody wants to actually um, get at your stuff, less than $50 will buy them a piece of code that will get in and it will uh, get through your protection that you put on there. So there are three different levels of protection in general for Excel. One of them is uh, to open the worksheet or to open the workbook itself. Um, another one is you can protect individual cells in the worksheet or you can hide uh, sheets, you can protect sheets. Um, and you can also protect your, your macros as well. Again, if it's high security stuff, do not use Excel for doing it. Okay, that's great, Declan. Um, Tatiana, there was just asking, well, thanks for the great presentation and will the slides be available? And I, I suppose I can confirm that the presentation and copies of all those uh, programs, all that code that Declan's gone through tonight, he's making them available. So Maureen in Engineers Ireland will uh, be putting them, uh, making them available to everyone who attended tonight. So uh, thanks again, Declan. So look at um, just given the time and everything else, I might just um, say. Yeah, there's actually one more question. Yeah, there. sure, there's, sure. Uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so yeah. It's for Jared Scott. And the, the question is, would you tend to include checks on cells where data is entered uh, to correct format, i.e. correct dates and number ranges? And the answer for that, for making forms, absolutely. And the easy way to do it, um, so real quick one, is you go to data and validation, which I can't, it's not jumping out of me here at the moment. Um, but you go to data and validation, I can't see because my screen is too small here. Um, but you can set it like that so that you can only allow in, uh, for example, a date or a number range or whatever. But yeah, it's a good idea to do that. Okay, okay. And, and another one squeezed in there by Kieran. Um, can you transfer macros between workbooks? Uh, for example, if you have written it and used a macro in one workbook, and now you have a new set of data, which is saved in a separate file or workbook, is it easier to manually copy over the, the macro or can you import it? Um, yeah, you can do either. Um, you can you can go from here and you can there's an import file there so yeah you have to import your macro there again a little bit dangerous because you know you need to be careful of what's in the um the book the other way is if you um should be yeah uh, if you go to here you right click on your modules and you go insert and you go module it gives you a blank module and then if you've gotten the macro in um if it's in another excel sheet you can literally just copy the the, the text that's there or if it's in a text document or whatever, you can literally just copy it and paste it in. What you need to be careful of is that the sheet references are the same. So if it's looking, for example, for the summary sheet or the insert rows sheet, they need to be called the same thing or you need to change the macro uh, so that it's looking in the right place. Okay. Okay, Declan, I, I think that's it. Uh, you've answered everything that came in there. So look, at it, it just remains for me just to uh, say, say thank you very much. As you, I suppose like, like many programs, most of us only tip the iceberg with Excel. I think you've shown this evening, you know, the power of macros and how you can uh, unlock a lot of the potential that Excel 